I'm Alec Baldwin, and you're listening to Marketing Trends and the Leeds Art Week. We talk about brands a lot on Marketing Trends, from the relationships customers have with their favorite companies to the marketing strategies behind what makes them thrive. But while we spend all this time talking about brands, we don't often talk about the parent companies or the challenges they face when marketing a portfolio of multiple brands, each of which serves a very different demographic. Casper's Ice Cream is one of those companies. Casper's has outgrown the safety net of its beloved Fatboy Ice Cream sandwiches, and now it oversees three very distinct brands and products. What Casper's had known and done for so long with Fatboy wouldn't necessarily work with its broader product portfolio, so something had to change. The opportunity to launch the good for you products really was a shift in mindset. You know, we'd always kind of sat around and we were the consumers of our products. We knew what the consumers wanted because we were that consumer. Trying to train ourselves and bring in experts on what the consumers of these other brands wanted was really relearning everything we thought we knew. Keith Laws is the EVP and corporate secretary at Casper's Ice Cream a family-owned and operated company producing Fatboy Ice Cream Sandwiches, Jolly Llama, and Churn Baby Ice Cream. On this episode of Marketing Trends, Keith provides the scoop on how Casper's utilizes influencer marketing strategies to push its brands to various target audiences, and he explains why the company continues to lean into national advertising to grow its business. Enjoy this episode. This message is brought to you by Salesforce. Hey marketers, today's B2B buyers are more complex than ever, and every buying committee has different needs and goals. Salesforce can help. We'll show you how to put each and every customer at the center of your B2B marketing strategy, and you'll learn how top brands like Lyft approach account-based marketing. Salesforce, market to every account, speak to every buyer. Find free B2B marketing and ABM resources at sfdc.co slash every dash buyer. Welcome to Marketing Trends. I'm Ian Faison, host of Marketing Trends. And today we are joined by special guest, Keith. How are you? Good. How are you doing, Ian? I am doing wonderful. We have a real sweet episode for everybody today. Uh, We're going to be talking about uh, marketing and ice cream two things that go together wonderfully well uh, and and all the amazing stuff that you're doing at, at Casper's Ice Cream. Let's get into it. How did you get started in marketing in the first place? Got started in marketing by accident, actually. Came out of college, wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. So I did a lot of different jobs, uh, did uh, some accounting, uh, did some computer programming, things like that. Finally fell into a role as a data analyst and Started uh, building uh, sales presentations for the company I was working for and uh, analyzing promotions and things like that. And so it just grew from that point. And so flash forward to today, tell us what it means to be CMO of Casper's Ice Cream. Well, Casper's Ice Cream, and I think with most uh, people in marketing today, it's uh, fast paced and it's never dull. Uh, Things are changing so quickly with social media it used to be a time when you you were running newspaper ads and fsis and radio ads you know to reach the consumer now you're doing the social media and you're you're getting responses immediately and it's just always changing so it's it's fast paced and just trying to keep up with the consumer is uh, never dull yeah, it is. It is never dull. Uh, for our listeners who don't know, they, they they might know some of your brands, but they might not know much about uh, about the company overall. Can you tell us more about Casper's and the uh, and the products that you all have? Yeah. So Casper's Ice Cream was founded by Casper Merrill uh, back in 1925. He was living on the family dairy farm. He was looking for something to do with the some leftover milk and stuff. So they had harvested ice uh, from the Cub River, which runs uh, right next to our current facility, actually. And um, he made uh, ice cream, nut sundaes on a bar, or bar that they sold at local uh, 4th of July celebrations. Uh, That grew into a business and eventually opened a facility uh, to manufacture ice cream products uh, in Logan, Utah. 
Um, they ran that facility until the 1970s when they decided to return to the family dairy farm and build a new manufacturing facility uh, where we currently stand. They ran in that facility until 2017. And at that point, the founder, Casper's grandson, was running the company. So Paul Merrill built a facility, a new high-tech facility that we are in now. So we're currently sitting on the old family homestead and have two manufacturing facilities. And we manufacture uh, three brands here of our own. We have our Fat Boy ice cream brand which is kind of our mainstream, the mainstay products that we do. It's uh, ice cream sandwiches, full dairy, full fat, just good old fashioned ice cream. And then um, a number of years ago, we purchased a good for you brand, uh, the Jolly Llama brand. And that focuses more on uh, fruit-based, um, non-GMO, non-dairy, allergen-free products uh, to reach those consumers. And then just recently, we've launched a Churn Baby uh, brand, which is a boutique ice cream brand, uh, super high premium um, with indulgent flavors and pretty unique. We create eight ounce ice cream cup and we put a whole cookie right on top, put some chocolate uh, swirl on it. And so just enjoy those uh, single serve products. So those, those are the items that we currently make and as well as co-packing for a lot of national brands. Yeah, what, what, is, uh, what does that mean? What's, what's uh, co-packing for national brands? So it seems uh, lately everybody has a great idea and they want to sell it, but not a lot of people um, have experience in manufacturing. So you have a great idea and you need somebody to make that product for you. You go out and you find a manufacturer who's willing to help you out and and uh, make those products. So we do that. We, we help a lot of brands that have started um, just ideas in their, you know, kitchens, you know, all the way up to, um, you know, venture capital has come in and helped the entrepreneur get started. And they're looking for, you know, to go to that next level. And, and we help a lot of those brands from their infancy, all the way up to national, you know, multi-billion dollar companies who are just out of production and need some help meeting demand and, and we can help those companies meet their, their demand as well. So when you have three distinct brands like that, and obviously uh, a company that's been around almost a hundred years, I'd imagine that, uh, you know, developing those target audiences is, is super unique and, and interesting. What goes into trying to figure out those different audience personas of, of the people who want those, those three different things, or, or maybe there's some crossover there. Yeah, so um, after, like you said, 100 years, you know, we were really focused on that, those mainstream items. And, and so when it came, the opportunity came to, to launch those, the good for you products really was a shift in mindset. You know, we'd always kind of sat around and we were the consumers of our products. We, we knew what the consumers wanted because we were that consumer trying to train ourselves and, and bring in experts on, on what the consumers of these other brands wanted was was really relearning everything you know we thought we knew there were a lot of things that we learned that uh, we actually push into our other products so with that Jolly Llama brand being um, all natural those, those consumers are so focused on what's in that product where do those ingredients come from were they you know responsibly sourced are they sustainable those types of things and we actually have started with our own, our other, you know, the Fat Boy brand, where that consumer is not as concerned about that. But we're finding that they are trending to start to be concerned about it because they hear so much about those things. And so we've we've tried to take some of those things that we've learned and actually improve those products. Um, you know, making the the uh, ingredients more sustainable and things like that. So really is a learning process. As you go through, there's a lot of research that we have to do. Like I said, we bring in experts, we do a lot of focus groups, just trying to, to relearn and retrain, you know, the, what the, the demands of those consumers are. Yeah. And so are, are there different 
um, channels that you're using to reach those different folks? Do you see that marketing to them in addition to the message is, is different? The message is definitely different, but we do find that there are a lot of crossovers. So social media, most people are on social media of some sort. It's just which influencers do they follow? Obviously with that, with the Fat Boy brand, we try to, try to do a little more traditional advertising as well that consumers, you know, used to it, that they've been our consumer for decades and, but trying to bring it into the, you know, modern age, you know, instead of printed billboards, we do digital billboards, which we can change and put in specific areas and change the message, you know, every day if we want to, and just to keep up with, with what's happening. So, so a lot of the tools we use are the same, but um, just different messages, just depending on, on uh, which brand we're, we're advertising and, and what consumer we're trying to reach. Do you have any favorite campaigns that you've, uh, you've run over the past few years? As far as campaigns go, I think the, the funnest thing we've done was just recently entering into the NASCAR and sponsoring a race, a driver and a car. The response was phenomenal. It was just really fun to be getting texts from family members from all over the country and friends and hey, we we can see your car and and those types of things. So that was that was really fun to kind of venture into something we've been wanting to do for years and just had is so expensive. We just had really shied away from it, and the opportunity came up, and we just couldn't pass it up. and And it it just turned out to be a, a great experience and. Uh, just really fun to be involved in. Yeah. Well, so what what goes into that to the thought process there and to to sponsoring that and what sort what sort of deliverables are you looking for or like what what types of engagement and different things? I I always love sponsorship. Our our listeners always hear me you know follow up a million questions about any type of sponsorship because I feel like they can be so fun and creative. Yeah. So with deliverables, there, there's a lot of things that came with that. So we're able to get um, a lot of mentions. Uh, there's a few publications that you get involved with. There's a lot of social media that you get to use the images with. We can use the driver and the car at different events at grocery stores and things if they're in the area. A certain number of tickets and sweet passes that we can that we've given out through social media to our consumers. So just enticing them. We just found that with especially the Fat Boy brand, NASCAR is just kind of right up their alley and just something that they enjoy. And so being able to offer passes and things to the, those consumers has, has been a really great benefit in, in participating with that. Sometimes there is a perception of, of how big or how small you, you know you are as a brand or a company. And I think that sponsorship, having that national spotlight really kind of brings you into that, um, elevates that perception to the consumer in the market to let them know that, yeah, you are a player in the market and, um, and are here to stay. So, and I'm, you know, I'm curious, especially when you're, you're looking at, uh, at activations, I'm sure, you know, whether it's, it's fat boy or, or the other brands that there are so many, um, so many places that they're sold. Like, what does that sort of activation look like? You know, the we, uh, you know, you, you hear the uh, win on Sunday, uh, sell on Monday, <laughs> as a uh, yeah. as as the common phrase there in in NASCAR. So I'm curious, uh, is, is that the sort of thing that you're expecting, or is it, or is it, you know, as the sponsorship goes on, there's more of an opportunity for people to hopefully, hopefully, they're eating fat boy during the race. A absolutely, and. The NASCAR fan is so loyal to those drivers. Those drivers don't need to win. I mean, you'll find that each driver really has a following behind them that are loyal to them no matter what, it seems like. And so as soon as you start, you know, our sponsorship with that, the, the responses were overwhelming of the driver we chose. We chose him really because of the values and, and the things that he kind of stood for really mirrored us as a corporation what what we wanted you know as somebody that would represent us and and so his fans were as supportive of him and basically 
you know, thanking us for supporting their driver and, you know, and we're going to be going out and supporting us in return. And, and so it's really great to see that, that synergy that's created from those fans. And it's really been an overwhelming response and, and, and really fun to participate in. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, that, that's really fun. Um, and definitely is one of those things where you get that great feedback and that great sentiment of people who, you know, maybe they knew about you all, maybe they didn't, uh, maybe they're already a customer, but now they have an addiction, an additional level of affinity, uh, to you that, that you probably couldn't have replicated if you tried. Yeah. If you have something common that you're, you know, both, both cheering for the same driver, you're, you're on the same team. Any other, any other campaigns or, or things, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious about Jolly Llama because so much of, uh, of a percentage of the way that people consume food now is, is through all the things that you mentioned, knowing the ingredients, having transparency there, having all that sort of stuff. Is there anything um, that you've found marketing that product that is, uh, that is different? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So a as a corporation, we've always strived to be a, a good corporate citizen as well as bringing a preferred employer in our area, um, trying to treat our employees better than the, the guys down the street and, and really trying to bring them in and, and take care of them and make them feel part of, part of a family um, at the company. You know, we do a lot of service um, out in the community for our own employees, things like that. Um, there's some local people that are have foundations set up that help uh, people who've been caught up in human trafficking and things like that. And th these are programs that we've participated in and, and uh, gotten our um, employees all certified in doing different things with some of these not-for-profit um, places. But um, we always kind of kept it on the down low and, and, and that the Jolly Lama consumers is passionate about things like that. And they want you to tell them and, blow your own horn and, you know, let them know what you're doing. And, and that's something very different that, you know, we really just tried to do things quietly in the past. And, and now with that consumer, like I said, we, we need to really tout those things that we're doing and let them know the things that we are participating in and, and how we are trying to make, you know, our communities better and tackling different social issues that normally you would just kind of keep to yourself. So. So that's a definite change in, in things that we're doing, just being more vocal about what we are supporting and things like that. So, and then we've also transferred that over to the Fat Boy brand as well and being um, a proud sponsor of the um, Tunnel for Towers organization for disabled veterans and things like that. Those, like I said, things that we would normally just kind of do quietly, we now put out there a little more than, than we have in the past. You mentioned influencers as a piece of this. Um, obviously, you know, influencers are, are more important than ever. They're a key part to some people's strategy. Uh, for others, not so much. Um, how do you think about the influencer ecosystem? That influencers are actually a major portion of what we do. Our marketing team manages three to 400 different influencers, micro-influencers, we use them to send the message that we have. We also use them to create a lot of the content that we use across all of our different platforms, such as Instagram and Facebook and all those different things. So we're able to leverage those relationships, like I said, messaging and content as well. So having those influencers and, and picking the right ones that, that mirror your values is extremely important to, to our marketing program. Yeah, I was uh, I was checking out the the website for FatboyIceCream.com to to check out the brand ambassador program ahead of this, and uh, and I thought it was such a a cool way of, of positioning and inviting people to to become uh, to become an ambassador. What are you looking for? Like, what if if like when your when your team is looking through those pitches, like what are the things that you want? I know you mentioned that you know having a, a similar you know values and those sort of things. Are, are there certain like thresholds or metrics that you want to see um, them? Is there like a, a posting cadence and things like that? We have a, a team that's that's more dialed in to the actual um, 
like I said, the cadence, like how many, the followers and those types of things. But, but overall, it's more, you know, for the fat boy, we're looking for people who are family oriented or um, more looking for like social events, whether they're big gatherings with friends and family, those types of, of things, people that kind of focus on that. That, that brand really has, has lent itself to, to, like I said, family gatherings, um, reunions, uh, parties, things like that, is that product. Those influencers that are, they're involved in different things like that. And then Jolly Llamas, you know, those health conscious people that are pushing the, you know, the different ingredients that, that you're trying to highlight. So a lot of filtering through everybody that's out there and, and then and then just trying them out and then just seeing the responses that you're getting, which is what's great about, you know, social media and that is you you can tell really quickly with just one or two posts, you know, the reactions and 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 whether or not you're you're hitting the mark or not. So it's it's fairly inexpensive. Um, so you can um, try it and you know get out quick, get in quick. So it's it's really really good for those those kinds of trials. So, well, as uh, as somebody who uh, who loves some dairy free uh, ice cream and uh, and all that stuff, uh, I haven't checked out Jolly Llama. I'm going to do it after this. I should have done it ahead of this so I can yeah. I could give you my reviews. But I I know that they're uh, sold in Sprouts uh, down the road for me. So uh, I I just got to go check it out. Yeah, we actually, we had launched a dairy-free, gluten-free ice cream cone. And so what was really interesting is, is that product alone in three months outsold our core fruit push-up pops that we've been selling for a decade. And the feedback that we got from consumers was was really kind of fun. A lot of moms were just touting how their kids, you know, would go to parties or whatever, and they'd never enjoyed an ice cream cone because there weren't gluten-free, dairy-free options for them. And so one of the big things we were getting back is, is our kids are like normal kids. They can actually have an ice cream cone like their friends have and be able to be part of the group now, which was really fun to hear. So that was just, it was one of the, one of the, the byproducts that we weren't expecting to get from that. We thought, well, we're just going to be hitting those health conscious people, but having parents tell us that their kids were finally, you know, able to feel like they were part of the group again was, was really, really a fun thing to hear. That is rad. And you know, it's like, I, I bet if you had tried to figure out um, how to create that message, you could have sat there in a room with your team for a few months and, and bang your head against the wall and you'd never would have got that uh, that type of a, a customer case study. It's just always so important, you know, to be listening to your audience and hear that stuff. How do, how do you listen to those folks? We go to a number of uh, health conventions um, where, you know, food manufacturers can have booths. So we do a lot of that, um, get feedback there. Um, we do Zoom focus groups, do a lot of surveys online, things like that. And, and then just with our social media, the posts that we get back, um, just trying to gather, you know, the, that information and, and trying to, to hit those hot points that that, that consumers feels is important. So my, my wife messaged me, um, who's in the other room that she said that, uh, Jolly Llama is the best name ever and that she's yeah. pregnant and she needs some. So apparently I have my, I have my, uh, responsibilities after this uh, interview to go to the store, head over to Sprouts. It, it is funny the the name, the name alone brings people to your booth or your, your setup. Even if it's just a comment, how much they love the name. There's something about llamas. People are just drawn to them for some reason. So the name is awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, it just, it creates a lot of buzz. Just, just look name alone. So Oh, they're great. It's a great animal. I'm a huge yeah. fan. We have uh, llamas uh, and alpacas at a, at a farm near us and um, always love to see them. They're okay. great. You know, we, we, we talked um, about, you know, the listening, as you mentioned. And when it comes to marketing a brand like yours, where, you know, you're at the end of the day, you're not selling direct to consumer uh, in, in most cases. 
you're you're relying on folks to to make that purchase decision in the grocery store, you know, somewhere else, but you still want to drive that brand awareness and engagement. Um, I, I know you you had a um, you had a ton of social media attention from the NASCAR uh, race last year and and got a, a huge activation there, as you kind of talked about a little bit. Well, how do you measure those type of activate activations? What do you look at in terms of data to track whether or not things like that work in the immediate term or the medium term or the longer term? So immediately we look for responses. So as we make posts, are we having more followers? Are there people responding to the to the posts we're making? Um, with all the different metrics available through social media, you can really track the engagement that you have on social media. So that that's immediately how we're uh, tracking those things is, is that engagement for those different posts, the types of posts we're doing, those types of things. Um, long-term is, you know, like you said, is, is with those buyers making the decision at retail, is, is their perception of, of us trying to help them understand the demand for our products and, and the, the people that it will bring to their, their locations by carrying it. So that's a more long-term plan that we go for. So, Are there any other, you know, things that you've done uh, in the past uh, year, obviously, you know, COVID being um, a crazy time for everyone and we're coming out of that you know, the world is kind of changing. Are, are there any things that you're looking forward to in the next year of, of potentially either opportunities for marketing or, or ways to, uh, to, to drive some more, you know, brand interest or, or maybe some in-person activations or things like that? Yeah. Um, during COVID, we had a real push, especially on the Fat Boy brand, because it had such a following of families and groups and, and parties things like, you know, people serving it at get togethers, we really kind of tried to remind people, you know, of the times they had enjoyed together, enjoying our products. And so kind of trying to push to that, you know, saying, Hey, remember fat boy, you know, give us a try and bring back, you know, those, those memories of, of the times you had and, and moving forward, remember fat boy, you know, for those parties, when you get, when we're finally able to get back together again, and and bring us back to the table. It's really a change. I think um, there's a lot of focus on um, safety and things like that. Our products being single serve, there's a, a trust there. You know, it's 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 wrapped. You're not scooping. You know, from the same tub of ice cream and sharing. You know that type of stuff. So there, there's a big push. You know, on emphasis on that on on the health of, of that and and so. So those are those are some of the things that, that we'll be that we'll be looking at um, and seeing how those messages are received. Over the past decade, you know, Ural's company has has really grown, uh, you know, exponentially here. Any uh, any secrets to some uh, some marketing success here as as the company has has grown and scaled, and especially since you've you've had a bunch of roles within the company, not just not just marketing but managing other pieces as well. The biggest thing for us has been um, consistent quality over the decades. If you, if you look at our competition, um, some of the things that they've decided to do, whether they lower butter fat, shrink size, things like that, those are things we've always tried to stay away from as far as that goes. Um, we try to remain true to the brand. So our consumer knows when they think back and We've been around for so long. A lot of them were introduced to us as, as children and, you know, their grandparents at their grandparents' house or things like that. And so, so when they try the product again, it brings back those memories because it hasn't changed over the years. And so that's really been our, our focus is to try to remain true to the brand and then also remaining, you know, relevant to the consumer as, as their needs change. Like I said, um, the things we learned from that, the good for you brand and and the changes that we can make to the other brands to make them more relevant as as that consumer becomes more educated with all the things they do just because they're not necessarily a good for you consumer they still are hearing all the news and things like that about ingredients and things and so 
you have to know that that consumer is just naturally going to be, you know, curious about, well, what's in the products that I'm eating? I might not be as concerned about it, but it's still, you still want to make sure that, that you're being responsible and making those changes that make sense while still remaining true to the brand. Okay, let's get into our lightning round questions. These questions are fast and easy, just like marketing with Salesforce. You can go to salesforce.com slash marketing to learn more about marketing on the world's number one CRM. That is Salesforce. Put your customer at the center of every interaction. Go to salesforce.com slash marketing to learn more. Lightning round questions. Keith, are you ready? I believe I am. Number one, what is your favorite product from the Casper's portfolio? I would have to say that my favorite is the Caramel Pralines Fat Boy Ice Cream Cone. What is your favorite thing to do when you're not working in Utah? I love to snowmobile and ride motorcycles. What is your best piece of advice for a first-time CMO? Be ready for change. It's, it's going to come at you and uh, be open to it. Your first instinct may not always be the right one and be open to opinions uh, from those around you. If you weren't in marketing at all or, or, or even business at all, what do you think you'd be doing? I'm not that close to retirement, so I haven't even gotten that far. Um, <laughs> I would probably want to be a tour guide uh, at some national park or something outdoors awesome keith well that's it that's all we got for today any uh any final thoughts anything uh anything to plug obviously our listeners should check out all the uh amazing things that uh casper's ice cream has to offer uh fat boy jolly llama churn baby and and check uh check out if they're near you in the grocery near you anything else just everybody stay safe and uh hopefully enjoy some uh ice cream it uh is great with everything so yeah it is i'll be uh i'll be heading to the store after this uh per the mandate uh that i have now um so <laughs> i uh we we really appreciate you uh coming on the show yep thank you for your time marketing trends podcast is brought to you by salesforce discover marketing built on the world's number one crm salesforce Put your customer at the center of every interaction. Automate engagement with each customer and build your marketing strategy around the entire customer journey. Salesforce, we bring marketing and engagement together. Learn more at salesforce.com slash marketing.